Montgomery. An interview with Field Marshal, the Viscount Montgomery of Alamein. With the Lord Taylor of Harlow. During the past few days, uh, Memorial University of Newfoundland has had the privilege of having as its guest Field Marshal Montgomery of Alamein. Field Marshal Montgomery, many of you, those of you who are under 21, will not remember the days of the war, the dark days of the war, when he was leading the Allied forces, and in particular the British Army and the armies of the Dominions, to begin the great conquest of Nazi Germany. War is a horrible business, and the field marshal, but it sometimes is necessary. Unfortunately for Britain, we seem sometimes to have thrown up the man to meet the occasion. And I think we were very fortunate indeed that in those dark days, Field Marshal Viscount Montgomery of Alamein was in command. Now, Field Marshal, I want to ask you something straight away about, uh, about I've noticed that great men have very great and very surprising mothers very often. Is this the case with you? Well, I certainly had a mother with a very dominant willpower. And I think that as a boy, I was pretty bad. I had, I had a willpower too. And my early life was a series of, of clashes between my mother and myself. And I don't think it was good. So I, uh, I don't think really that my mother influenced me except to make me feel afraid of her, which is not good. Now, all my love and affection as a, as a boy, a young boy, was given to my father who was a bishop, and he took no part in the handling of the family. He was always a communing with the angels, whatever they do, bishops, you see. <laughs> he had no part at all in it. And my mother used to give him 10 shillings a week, and if he wanted another shilling, he had to go on his knees to get it. We had no money. We were a family of nine, and at a very early age, I disappointed my parents by saying that I wanted to be a soldier. Well, thank goodness you did. <laughs> now, you have been, ever since, uh, in command of men. Yeah. And uh, so in, the, in the First World War, you were in c command of a very small group of men. Started like that. Yeah. I went out to the First War in 1914, commanding a platoon of 30 men. Now, that was my first uh, introduction to leadership of men in battle. I had been commanding uh, in peacetime, not the same thing. Was it? And I found then that uh, what you could do with those 30 men would depend entirely on me. And if I could gain their, their confidence and their trust and the, their respect, they needn't necessarily like me, not necessarily, their respect, then the greatest achievements became possible within that little group. Well, as I went up the ladder, and I commanded a company in battle, and a battalion, and I commanded, a, I finished up the first war as chief of staff of a division, but later on I commanded a brigade, and a division, and an army corps, and an army, and a group of armies, two million men. Two million men, that was the biggest? Normandy. The biggest single number you commanded. Yeah, because I had, you see, for Normandy, I had all the American armies under me, <coughs> and uh, the total number, really, by the time we finished up the Battle of Normandy, was a matter of two million men. Now, uh, I found, of course, that bottled up inside men are great emotional forces, and it may be the same with your students here. They have certain emotional forces, and they've got to be given an outlet. And that outlet must be positive and constructive and must warm the heart and excite the imagination. That is the thing, you see. I also found that uh, the soldiers, having been through both wars, the soldiers of the Second War were totally different people to those of the First War because they were educated. 
You see, the, in the first war, the, I think the, the best recruiting sergeant was starvation, off the streets. You didn't enlist in the army unless you were starving for the soldiery. So naturally, you see, we went out to the first war and they did what they were told. And the, 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 the generalship, I always think, of the first war would not have done in the second war with these highly educated people who could think and appreciate and wanted to know what was going on. Now, in this first war, war the generalship was really uh, seemed to operate regardless of loss of life. It seemed the most brutal kind of generalship and an unreal kind of generalship. Is this a fair comment? Well, it is, yes. What they would call the, the good fighting generals, mm -hmm. see, of the First War were really the generals who uh, had the most casualties. I mean, for instance, I took, that in, took part in the Battle of the Somme in July uh, 16, and there were 30,000 men killed before lunch. Before lunch, you see. And a frightful battle, really. And uh, that had, uh, now at Alamein, for instance, I fought for 12 days, Alamein, and my total casualties in 12 days were just 13,000, you see. It can be done. When you say 13,000, that 13,000 killed or 13,000 killed and wounded? All categories. How many killed? I should think about a third. All categories, killed, wounded, missing, and so on, you see. Staggering, isn't it? Well, that uh, can be done, you see. And I think also, of course, that in the first war, what I would call the, the good fighting generals, they weren't professional, real professionals. I, I was so horrified by this, what went on, and Passchendaele, and all these, uh, these dreadful things, that uh, I got very badly wounded, you see. And I had, uh, when I lay in hospital, pondering over this matter, I came to the conclusion that war was a highly professional business. And there is no room in war for the amateur. So I decided that I would study my profession and get right down to it, and I gave up everything. Everything. I took no part in social life. I worked. I didn't get married till I was uh, 40. Never went out with girls. Nothing. I wasn't interested in girls. <laughs> but now, if you take the... Um, how did you manage? You faced... You could lead your 40 men or your small group, and they all knew you personally. Yeah. How did you get them to know you when you were commanding these millions of men? Could you do it? Yes, it can be done. For instance, when I went out to the desert, I found that the generals, the soldiers, didn't know their generals. The only general the soldiers knew was Wallow. Well, I said, that is no good. They're, they're going to know me. Because mm -hmm. uh, I knew the, the type of man, you see, we were now having to fight the wars of Britain. And I made myself known to the soldiers. I would talk to them. I'd go and see them. Now, when we went, uh, that went right away through in the Eighth Army. And when we were at home, you see, and I had my British armies, Canadian army, and all the Americans, about two million. <coughs> I went home from the Eighth Army, and nobody knew me. And the soldier said, who, who is this guy in Montgomery? We've heard of some chap who, in the desert, who wears a berry with two, two badges on it. <laughs> Let us have a look at him. I knew this. So I decided, having, having formed the plan and got it uh, working, got it going, I left it entirely to my staff. And I traveled England and Scotland, showing, uh, talking to the soldiers. And I would talk to 20,000 at one go. I would uh, go and talk to them from uh, uh, standing on the, the bonnet of a jeep with a loudspeaker, and then I would say, now, come around me closer. Let's have a look at each other. And uh, they would all rush forward, and the officers gently got swamped. You know. <laughs> but they liked it. And I don't think, I think, it's, I, think I can say that uh, no man went across to Normandy who hadn't seen me and heard me speak. Now, I hoped, of course, I hoped <laughs> that they would approve. <laughs> I hoped it. Perhaps it was rather too much to hope. Anyhow, I think they did approve, really, in the end. They, they said, well, this guy looks all right. They hadn't done any fighting, you see. They knew I had. They knew that as far as battle was concerned, uh, I knew my stuff, you see. And that, I think, was a... Did you, only, did you ever lose a battle, Hilmar? No. Yes, <laughs> that's the important thing, isn't it? <laughs> I won. 
I once said to Winston Churchill, you like generals who win battles. You know, Winston said, you're telling me. <laughs> now, this surely, this surely has, has some lessons for all young people now and for those who are growing up in ordinary administrative jobs. Can you run ordinary civil administrations in the same kind of way that you ran your armies and took them to victory? Yes, I think you can. Now, uh, I think one of the big problems I had in my life from early on when I was a rebel, and I was a rebel in the army as I moved mm. up the army, I was a rebel. Whenever most people would say, yes, sir, I said, no, sir, you see, I didn't agree. And once or twice I was pretty, pretty rocky on the perch. In fact, I was, when I was battalion commander serving under Brigadier, he wrote on me an annual report which was quite dreadful. You see, we have in the army every year, you have a, an annual report which you have to see an initial. Well, I read this initial and I didn't care. And he, he really he said, this chap is a dreadful person. He thinks he's a cat's whiskers. <laughs> he's he's very, very far from the cat's whiskers. Now, that went up to the commander in chief. Yeah. And the commander in chief uh, looked at this and he seized his pen. And he said, I think Lieutenant Colonel Montgomery is a very good officer. I don't agree with this report. I think he's likely to rise to the highest ranks of the army. That was that. He then seized his pen and wrote his annual report on the Brigadier and sacked him. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's the thing. Yes. Uh, then in civilian life, you think that you can, in fact, do the same kind of methods and techniques of leadership as you used in the army. Yes, now that's a very interesting question. I think the first thing you've got to do is to conquer yourself. What do you mean by that? Well, if you, uh, I, I've told, I've seen a lot of schools here, I see, and I'm seeing one more tomorrow. Uh, I mean that uh, if you are going to handle men... And women? And women too, which is much, much more difficult. <laughs> if you're going to handle men and women, you've got, and, and control them in life, you've got first to learn to command and control yourself, you see. And in other words, uh, put it differently, you say to conquer yourself. Now, I was never told that when I was a young boy, that I must, uh, I must learn to control myself. Never told me. I should have been told. In fact, I said to a school the other day, you can't say that. I've told you now, you see. And if you, if you can't command and control yourself and conquer yourself, you won't be able to do this to other people. That's the first thing I learned, you see. Well, I then learned that uh, you've got to, if you are handling large bodies of men, or even small bodies, you've got to get them with you. They must be with you, you see, and, and feel that uh, their best interests are secure in your hands, and that you want nothing for yourself, nothing. You are entirely out to do the best you can for them. Now, if you can do that, then men, the soldiers, will follow you. Of course, all soldiers will follow a successful general. They like it. And the curious thing is that soldiers would accept casualties provided they win. They'll do it. But they do like, you see, what soldiers don't like is if, if the battlefield is left lying about with dead bodies and things. They don't like it. They, they like the, the dead to be collected and reverently buried and all that sort of thing. They're very curious people, soldiers. See, they like that. Perhaps they're just ordinary human beings, you know? They're ordinary human beings, just like you and I. And, of course, the same with generals. I mean, we're, we're, we're all human, we make mistakes, and we're all different. That's what it is. As you look around the world today, Field Marshal, do you see the need for leadership still there? Oh, terribly. Terribly. And I see it in industry. I think many of the problems that go on in uh, in uh, the world today is due to the, the bad leadership on the parts of the people in high places. Do you see it in universities? Well, I've, I've not seen it here. I mean, <laughs> I did say when I made a speech the other day that the students 
in, in Europe, in England, Paris, Germany, they seem to have gone mad. For the moment, you're all right here, for the moment. You, see, you, you, must, you mustn't let, they, they seem more docile here. They're not more docile, they're just slightly more intelligent and mature. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's very important, you see, that these young people should understand what's going on in the world today. Yeah. That's the point, you see. Now, what is going on in the world today? Well, what's going on in the world today is that after the late... I've been through two great world wars, and in neither case have we received the, the benefits and the peace, which was which we were led to believe would happen, and even promised. That's the politicians. I mean, in the first war, we won the war militarily, we lost the peace. This late war, we, we, Hitler's war, uh, we won, but we lost the peace. These are the, the East. Mm -hmm. Now, the world today is split. It's split in two, with two conflicting ideologies and social systems. I think that's inevitable. It so happens, you see, that the, the eastern part of the world are communists. Well, <coughs> it, it suits them. <coughs> and it's no good saying you mustn't be communists. They are. What we've got to do is to stop it coming our way. Oh, yes. Now, where do we stop it? We stop it uh, on the seas. You see... We don't stop it on land. Well, you can't... Uh, I maintain, you see, that the first thing the... Uh, the uh, leaders of the West have got to understand that this nation of China, which I know very well indeed, of course, and Mao Zedong, who was a great friend of mine, you see, I, I've been right across China, what they've got to understand is that nothing can prevent China from dominating the mainland of Asia. Nothing. And I don't think it matters. When you say the mainland of Asia, do you mean the uh, main, the peninsula going down, the Southeast Asia, or do you include India in that? I don't include India because it's in, the Indian subcontinent is very necessary in the West, very necessary, and I think we should give it massive aid and stop it going, going with the Eastern Bloc. But what is necessary is that we, we should control the water areas of the world, the seas, and major oceans like the Atlantic and the Pacific and the uh, Indian Ocean, you see, right throughout history, that side which controlled the seas, in the end, prevailed. Now right that, throughout history. That isn't the corollary that that side which controls the air will prevail these days? Well, yes, but it's not, uh, it's it controlled air in a rather different way, you see, because you have these uh, weapons which you can loose off, you see, and uh, uh, nuclear weapons. The seas are the big thing, I think. Now, if you go back, of course, I've, uh, in my study of, uh, of war, I've had to study a lot of history. I've had to, because war is history, and history is built up on war. And I went right back to the Greek-Persian Wars, and very interested indeed, of course, in the, in the wars between Rome and Carthage. Now, Carthage was the, the most, uh, biggest enemy that the Romans ever had to face, you see. And uh, Hannibal went over the Alps and he went down into Italy and uh, tried to control you know, the great Carthaginian, you see. And uh, he was opposed, finally, by Scipio Africanus, who said, leave him there, leave him in Italy we will go across the seas and defeat him at the Battle of Zama in 202 BC, which he did. Now, a very curious thing happened in that battle. Before the battle began, Hannibal and Scipio met in the middle to talk things over. Did they really? Yeah. Where? Well, on, the, on land? On the battlefield. On the battlefield. Yeah, here was one, the Carthaginian army, and there was the Roman army. And it was, uh, I think it was Hannibal who proposed it to Scipio, that they should have a talk, have a talk, and see if they couldn't reach some agreement. Mm -hmm. And they met in the middle. Now, uh, if Rommel had said to me, <laughs> man, let us meet and have a talk and see if we can't do something about it, I would have said no. Although I have been very uh, pleased to, to see my famous opponent, 
No. This is war. I, I know the future. Smash you in battle. And I'm not going to uh, talk about how we can uh, settle this thing. We can't settle it except by battle. But now, was ha Hannibal a political leader as well as a, a military leader, or well, he was, was this no, a sort he of was, military fix-up? He, he was, was no, he was under the Carthaginian Senate. Yeah. He was, but he was a great leader, you see, mm -hmm. a great general, a great uh, battle general, and he met a greater one when he met Scipio, and that's why Scipio Africanus, you see. When I received the honorary degree at Cambridge, they 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 uh, described me as a uh, Bernard Law Montgomery Africanus. <laughs> because I had done a lot of fighting in Africa. Well, you're now Bernard Law Montgomery Terry Novi. Yes, <laughs> yes, I know. But uh, you see, you can't get away from it. It's the handling of men. If you understand how to handle men, and now women, I command a great many women. In fact, I had quite an argument with uh, Lady Summerskill in the House of Lords once. I don't know whether you were there who said that the noble and gallant, I'm gallant, you see, in the House of Lords, knows nothing about women. So I said, well, I'm, I, I've commanded more women than the noble ladies ever commanded <laughs> in the war, <wars. laughs> But I've enjoyed my, my soldiering life chiefly because of my association with men. Men. That is what life consists of. If you can understand and handle men, uh, and now women, you really needn't bother anymore because they are the people who live on this earth. You needn't worry too much about the cash side. No, that is one of the troubles today, you see, in, uh, in, in the young people in, in England. I think they, they rather turn towards materialism. They want to make money. Well, money isn't everything, you see. The thing is happiness. And the boys from the universities want to go into a profession where they'll make money. But the point is, will they be happy? You see, my, my own son, you see, he, uh, he, uh, I wouldn't send him to the university until he, it, it was, he decided what he was going to do in life. You've only got one life. The Almighty gave you one life. What are you going to do with it? And he wouldn't decide. I said, right, I'm not going to send you to the university. And then you'll go into some drugstore and sell medicines. Never. We don't want a degree for that. And so he finally decided that he wanted to be an engineer. And so I said, right, go to Cambridge and take the mechanical sciences tripos, which he did. And he became an engineer, he went into Shell. And he stayed for 12 years in Shell. And then he said, I must come home, my children are growing up. And he's now in Yardley, the, the cosmetic people. So he did go into a drugstore, almost well, in the end. <laughs> well, you see, every drugstore you see Yardley products, you see. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, so life is changing in a way, isn't it? Here is your son choosing to be an engineer and then uh, going into business. Yeah. Uh. He, uh, there was a time, you know, when he uh, might have wanted to be a soldier. He was at Winchester, because Winchester is one of these schools where if you want to be a soldier, they pushed out you pretty quick, you see. It's an a academic school. And when he went, he had to do national service. When he did national service, he, uh, he won the, the sort of honor he was up to. And he went into the tanks, and he learned about men, which is very, stands him in good stead now, so he learned about men. Would you like to see compulsory military service in every country? Do you think it's a good thing? Well, uh, militarily, it's a good thing. You see, we and Canada are the only two people in the Western Defense Organization who don't have national service, you see. From the point of view of the boys, it's extremely good. I mean, a boy comes in to do his national service, and he probably goes away and does a bit of fighting somewhere, you see, and he comes back a man. When he goes to the university, he's a man. Totally changed, you see. But politically, politically, in the climate today in England, you can't have it. You can't have it. I doubt if you can in Canada. No, I shouldn't think so. But there's a great difference here in Canada that the young people spend much more of their summers, for example, working hard and doing outdoor jobs very often, yeah. which helps them to grow up in the same kind of way that military service does in Britain. Yes, serving the community and earning money. That's right. Yes. Doing both. But I think that this materialism is, can be a danger. A boy says, I want to, you say to a boy at school, what are you going into? Going into father's business. Mm -hmm. You say, that's not necessarily 
he wants to make money. You, now, these young boys in America, young boys and girls in America, who are facing the problem of should they join up and serve their countries in a war of which most of them heartily disapprove. Vietnam. Vietnam. It's a dilemma for them, isn't it? Yes, it is, of course. Uh, I think myself, of course, that the Vietnam conflict is being wrongly handled because if you go fighting, the battle, uh, the, the battlefield, the battle must be within some strategical framework. Well, it isn't. You see, if you, if you say to, I once said to Richard Nixon recently, can you explain to me what is your political strategy in the Far East? They haven't got one. They don't know. That's no good, you see. You must have, uh, and the other day, you know, here in, uh, when I said that, I think it was in the freedom ceremony when I gave some advice to the politicians except ye utter by the time words easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken, you see? <laughs> St. Paul, uh, uh, epistle to the... That was, that was... Uh, Corinthians, isn't it? Corinthians. Mm -hmm. First epistle. But now, uh, for instance, supposing you... I have suffered from this. And if you were to read the instructions given to Lord Gault, when the BEF went over to France in 1940, you really wouldn't know whether it was Christmas or Easter. <laughs> I mean, hopeless. You couldn't, I couldn't, you couldn't understand them. If, you, if this happens and if you do this, you see, it's not clear cut, you see. Funny enough, last night I was reading your instructions uh, about a page of them, yeah. and they were pretty good. Well, they were quite... I always say, you see, that uh, I don't... I never expect anyone to agree with me. But what I do say is that what I write or say is quite clear. And at least they know with what they're disagreeing. That's right. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's the big thing. You yeah. must know that. And I, can you teach your students that?